Good afternoon. Good evening to everybody. I hope you're keeping well. Uh, my name is Ruth Crooks from Women Empowered Global Headquarters. Welcome to the African Women Voices on Coronavirus, brought to you by the African Women Leadership Forum and Women Empowered Global. I acknowledge the presence of participants from around the globe, namely Uganda, Cameroon, the United Kingdom, Tanzania, South Africa, Nigeria, Australia, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Gambia, Switzerland, and others, and apologies if I've missed your country. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of, of our African Women Leadership Forum country chairs, Ruth from Cameroon, hi Ruth, uh, Peniel from Nigeria, Day from Gambia, Ida from Kenya, Fatma from Tanzania, and Batesena from South Africa. It's a pleasure to have everyone on board. Um, our theme for today is the impact of coronavirus on our lives, our communities, our workplaces, and tips to help us cope during this trying time as we acknowledge that though we have a common enemy, no two struggles are the same or have the same remedy. Our speakers from this event hail from different parts of the globe and different economic sectors. We have Ms. Santa Bachan from Imagination Cameroon, Ms. Peniel Edomwade, who is the African Women Leadership Forum Chapter Chair for Nigeria, Ms. Mm -hmm. Landy Ann, a Global Health Specialist from Reach Out Cameroon, Dr. Etamba Agbo from the United Kingdom, and Ms. Lynette Komugisha, an African Women Leadership Forum volunteer from Uganda. Our moderator for tonight, or for today, is Belvita Biban, who is a core committee member at African Women Leadership Forum. And with that, I'd like to invite Senela Jayasuria, who is the CEO of Women Empowered Global and the president of African Women Leadership Forum to deliver the opening address. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ruth. Uh, so, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, firstly, you know, very special thanks to all our guest speakers today. Very short notice, but here you are on board, ready to join us, hold our hands in our journey to make a difference, because this is the time to talk about this. There's no other time, and to come together from around the world representing this. So, thank you, and lovely to have you once again. So, what I have done is really, I am going to take you through a few slides that I developed just for you to give you a quick orientation into a little bit of what the African Women Leadership Forum is, and then we dive into today's fantastic lineup. So come with me into a few slides. So the first thing I want to tell you is the vision of the African Women Leadership Forum. We believe that an empowered African woman makes the African economy stronger. Our vision is to build her confidence, to do so to teach her important leadership skills to reach her destination of success. So it's really an initiative by Women Empowered Global. It's a strategic uh, initiative because we see that we really want to change the narratives of leadership for women in Africa. And how we do this is because Women Empowered Global by itself is a global muscle and a global engine that connects local women globally. And we are specializing capacity building as it is. And with that, we birthed the African Women Leadership Forum. And we have chapters across six countries right now in the continent, chapter two hours, and it's a growing membership. So we are into mentoring, we do training, we have networking forums. We have the awards, which we initiated this year. You'd see the flyer to your right, where we recognize women who are at the ground level making remarkable contributions in Africa across five different sectors. And the awards uh, deadline entries are closed and we, will, we are in the process of shortlisting the uh, award winners and the announcement will be done very soon. Very excited. Then we separately also conduct live online business skill training. And then we also conduct live online soft skills development. Technical skills alone is not enough. Funding alone is not enough. We need to teach our women decision-making skills, negotiation skills, perseverance, 
networking, all of that. And finally, I also want to highlight, it's not a one-way teaching that we do. We also open it up into in-depth Q&A where we actually assess candidates, we give them feedback. There is a lot of spot mentoring opportunities for the women who attend our master classes. And of course, your official website is beautifully mentioned on the screen. And I also want to uh, quickly mention to you that we are launching a newsletter. Uh, our committee member Samuel is online as well. And this is where we want to ask you to submit to us your humanitarian stories that we can share with the world. So all you need to do is follow this process. Please register, the, uh, you have to register as a member and send us your stories. So without further ado, I want to wrap it up by telling you that if you want to find us on social media, these are the social media handles. It's so important that even after this call, you have to take this opportunity to network. Don't just receive this information, do something with it, apply it and advance the status of where you are professionally and personally in your life. So these are the social media handles to find us. And if you have any further questions, we'll take them after each Q&A session and again, right at the very end. And with that quick induction into what we stand for and why we do what we do, we are so passionate about it and we are very serious about it. So with that, I want to open the stage up to Velvita Viban, who is going to be our moderator and also she is a core committee member of the African Women Leadership Forum. So with that said, Velvita, over to you. Can you guys hear me? Now we can hear. Yep, yep. Okay, good, good. Thanks, yep. Janela. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much, Ruthie, for having um, given us a brief um, rundown of what today's program is about. I know everybody has been talking about the coronavirus and what it means. Um, oh. I think my I think my network is playing a fast one. I hope everybody can hear me. I just want to say thank you to everybody who joined us on this call. If you're joining us, you can just do a thumbs up or send us a message so we know who's online. Um, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I can see everybody do a thumbs up. Um, this call really, as Ruth put it, is to listen to women across the continent, women across the globe share their ideas on what this virus is going to mean for us as women. And it's important for us to have these conversations. It's important for us to support each other primarily because that is what Women Empower Global is about. And that is what African Women Leadership Forum is about. So um, we're going to kick off the first session. I just want to make sure everybody is online. We're going to check in with Country Insight. I'm not sure if all our Country Chapter Chairs are online. If you're online, please let me know. I see. Um, I'm not sure. I see Peniel. I, I don't think Peniel has. Has Peniel joined us? No? Oh, yes, yeah, she has. Oh, great. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm gonna unmute Day. Tatu, are you with me? Can you unmute yourself, please? Um, okay. Good. Hi. Hi, Fatu. So can you share with us, um, we're just doing checking in, what, how does, how, how is the virus so far in your area? What are the measures? How are people feeling? Like, what's the feeling around your area? What does it feel like? Just kindly introduce yourself and your country, and then you can proceed. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Dave Fatu, and I'm from the Gambia, the chapter chair for Gambia. And it's so good to be here with all of you. And recently in the Gambia, we have like four cases and two are uh, recovered and discharged. Uh, unfortunately, one died and another one is still, you know, 
in, 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 in quarantine. So we are hoping for the best. But the, in the country, everybody is abiding by the rules. We are looking out for the safety measures. Everybody is taking the safety measures. Everyone is staying home. And we are hoping for the best. So we thank God that it's, it's, everything is contained for now. I mean, we are still waiting. There were a certain people that were in the flight um, that had one of the ladies that was tested positive. So all those people are also in quarantine. They are about, um, I think, around 100 and something. But we are waiting for the 14 days to confirm if they are positive or negative. So fingers crossed. We hope that they are all negative so things can be um, contained here. And I hope you ladies are also taking good care of yourselves and your families and you are all, you know, staying safe as well. Great. Thank you, Fatu. Um, Peniel, I see Peniel is online. She's from Nigeria. So Peniel, if you would unmute yourself and share with us what it feels like, what are the measures being put in place? Uh, just share us the general vibe that's going on in, in, in your area. Everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's nice seeing everybody's face. So I think I'm just seeing Velveta's face for the first time. It's nice <laughs> seeing you. Um, Nigeria. Wow. Truth is, there's a lot of scare in town, um, especially in Lagos, Abuja. Um, Ibadan, that's or your state, some states generally. I think right now we have about 170 something cases. We've had, re we've recorded two deaths. Um, I think about eight people have recovered. But in all, confirmed cases are about 170 something as at this, as at last night, 8 p.m. last night. Um, there's a total lockdown in major. States in most states, um, so like Lagos, about Lagos State is still lockdown. I stay in Lagos State, but I had to take off, as in literally take off from Lagos to. I had to take off from Lagos to another state, to Abia State, to spend this season with my family, with my parents, my siblings. Um, so, Lagos is on a lockdown. Nobody is moving about. Abuja is also on a lockdown. The state I'm in just started their lockdown yesterday. That was 1st of April. So most states are on a lockdown. Um, some states have started, they, 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 we now have what we call the emergency food services, where food is being shared from home to home. As much as that will be possible, we have that going on. We have emergency markets because Major markets, are, all the markets had to be closed down, especially in Lagos. The um, only shops that are situated on streets, so in front of your house, you could display your wares, you could sell. And the only things that you can display or sell are food items, edibles. That, those are the only things you can sell. Every other thing is on a lockdown. Um, well, we are tr the lockdown is so that we can curtail the spread as much as we can. But truth is, with each passing second, we get to find more cases, more cases that, um, a lot more cases that are suspected to be the coronavirus, uh, they keep coming up. So, um, okay, so like um, a particular state just recorded like five, they didn't have any at all as at yesterday, but as of yesterday night, they recorded five confirmed cases and all of them were linked to an outreach that happened earlier uh, it happened like the middle of March. So middle of March, the second week in March was the World Glaucoma Week. And the, the, when, when, when the whole coronavirus thing started worldwide, it was said that outreaches, medical outreaches should stop. But unfortunately, this particular, um, they still held an outreach over there and they had people from outside the country come in to help. They had missionaries from outside the country come in to help. Unfortunately, that also introduced the coronavirus into that state. So as I yesterday for the first time, they recorded five cases. They're following up, but the way it is because, um, sorry to say, we really, we, 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 we are not yet good with data entry. So it's difficult to take a hold of 
most of the people that have come in contact with confirmed cases. But we trust that we're really hopeful that um, the lockdown, which is like 14 days, we're hopeful that there will be a decline and a total um, shutdown. Nobody, we, we don't find any other confirmed cases. It's supposed to be self-limiting. So we hope that in the, in the 14 days, whatever virus is in town will self-limit and we'll be fine to resume what we need to do. It's really taken a negative toll on a lot of people businesses are shut down people are scared um people are scared you're 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 being careful not oh you can't hear me Ketrin, can you hear me okay so people are scared um it's it's really taking a lot for people to not be scared because you can't step out. We have military men around, especially in Lagos. We have the military men around trying to stop people from stepping out. You step out, you're arrested, whether it be for food or whatever. Yes, it's, it's for a good cause, but it just dawned on me that a lot of us are not used to, we're not comfortable in our own skin. So right now, it's like a harsh reality we, we, we are facing. How to sit and you're alone and you have to like yourself you have to be comfortable with yourself have discussions with yourself a lot of people are not used to that we're used to the hustle and bustle of life so it's it's taking a deep toll on the emotions of people mental health finances nobody even knows what is going to happen post covid19 but we're hopeful we choose to remain hopeful we just choose to remain hopeful nice nice thank you so much Penny, for sharing that um if I gather well, there's a sense of fear, there's a sense of uncertainty, um, sure. but fear and uncertainty are the two things that are, um, that are, should I say, prevalent in Nigeria now as the virus spreads. Um, I think we have others from, I'm not sure if Fatima from Tanzania is online. I can't seem to find her. Um, that is Ruth around. Ruth, please. Ruth Debbie from Cameroon. If you're online, we would like to hear from you as well. We do have Catherine online. Catherine, would you like to share some comments with what's happening? The camera is frozen. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Yeah, hi, Catherine. You can go ahead. We're hearing you. I think my camera is frozen, so I'll just yeah, call. I'm okay, um, currently I'm in Nigeria, so I might not get the exact statistics in Cameroon, but uh, the cases are really, really uh, going on, and there is a lot of cases. Um, uh, I checked this morning and I noticed that the number is every like every week so we have so far about uh, seven deaths and the total number is uh, the total number of people is about 200 and seventy something and just anything that we provide so it's really a scary situation and I think I think yeah I think you're I think your mic has a problem or your software will be quite a problem. Catherine, we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Are you beside a oh. fan or something that has broken? Because there's quite oh, a problem. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, that's okay yes, that's better. Yes, that's better. Okay. All right. So, where did I stop? Um, you mentioned that there have been 
seven deaths, 10 recoveries, 200 and um, eight something people. Yes, yes, yes. And I spoke with my family earlier. The updates I got from them is everywhere is locked down. Like what is happening in every other country, everywhere is closed now. And they are barely managing with what they got from last week. They are managing with food and water. So generally, it, it really is a scary situation. And it makes me think what the next weeks ahead are going to look like. Because I'm actually in Kwara State in Nigeria, and we don't have any case, any cases yet. But the neighboring towns are already recording some numbers, so it's it's frightening. And the fact that we don't have cars moving everywhere, just quiet, you know, it's it's not a good situation. And honestly, I'm really afraid of what tomorrow might look like. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's it. All righty. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing from Cameroon. Um, I, we were supposed to have Fatima from Tanzania, Iska from Kenya, but I don't think I can see them online. Um, but if there are any participants in the call, on the call who would like to share from um, insight from a different country other than the ones we have heard so, so far, Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, the Gambia, please just um, indicate and we'll unmute your mic so that you can share with us um, some information before we proceed to the next session. I see Lynette. Lynette, can you share um, some information from Uganda? Hi, hi guys. Hi, um, we can't see you, Lynette. Your video is off. Is it on now? Yes, yeah, on now. Okay, so I'm from Uganda. I am a student, and in Uganda, it the virus actually just came worse for a while. We have 44 cases right now, and the good thing is they're not within us. It's people who are from abroad that are quarantined and were formed with those cases. But within us, we do not have any cases yet. But still, we are in lockdown for 14 days, no school for 30 days, shops, everywhere is closed. It is, as everyone has said, a scary situation. But yeah, we're surviving. Yeah, that's all. Cool. Nice, nice. We're surviving. And that's what we women and the African Women Leadership do. We survive, we stay together, we share insights, we support our own, and we help each other beat this virus. I mean, I'm sure we can all combat this virus. It can't be more than women. I heard a joke that said, um, <laughs> the virus must have been sent by a woman. <laughs> but uh, besides that, <laughs> Besides that, I'm sure that if, if it's our problem, we can handle it, right, guys? We can't, right? Yeah, Hi. I really can see you. Um, so um, we're going to try to, before we dive into everything else, we have Miss Lindsay Ann. She's a, a global health specialist from an NGO called Reach Out Cameroon. And she's going to be sharing her perspective on understanding what this virus means how it's spread within communities, um, how how it can actually um, how we can actually contain it, but what are the things we should look out for? So in global, it's understanding the virus. Yeah, Ruthie, I know. It has, it, Ruthie, thanks for that comment. I just saw that. <laughs> um, um, how it affects um, us as, as a as a whole, as women, and how we tend to spread this virus in our communities without even realizing. So um, Ms. Lendi Ann from Reach Out Cameroon, would you like to unmute yourself and then go right ahead? Okay, hello guys. Hi. 
All right. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to do this talk and uh, share my experience and perspectives around uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, like I was rightly introduced, um, I'm Ngobiba Lendi Ann, but most often I prefer being called Lendi Ann for short. Uh, global health specialist with 12 years of experience in public health programming in Cameroon and abroad as well. And uh, it's actually an honor for me to go through this session with all of you wonderful ladies and gentlemen as per what I've seen. Um, and basically, I think it's quite, it was quite thoughtful of uh, you guys to have um, thought, to have taught it to come together and have some more knowledge and understanding around the disease itself and how it spreads within the community. So, um, because uh, we are all involved in different um, interventions in our community, some of us are humanitarians, or I guess others within the forum would be into development. Uh, however, the, the COVID-19 affects every country and has different impacts at different levels. And what's important is, is that we all are informed and we develop strategies to support and contribute in containing the, the spread of the disease and also look for ways uh, in which life-saving interventions can still be imp implemented at community level. So we'll go straight into the subject of the day. So uh, COVID-19 is actually a disease which is being caused by the virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which has been abbreviated or is being abbreviated as SARS-CoV-2. So that's the name of the virus which causes the disease COVID-19. Although most people in, the commu in our communities just generally call it coronavirus. Uh, but it's good to know that coronavirus, uh, that the, this SARS-CoV-2 virus is belongs to a part of a family of viruses which all which are all called coronaviruses and these viruses affect both uh, humans and animals and and these viruses are not quite new uh, to the science world and in the public health um, field because first cases were of coronaviruses were identified somewhere sometime around the early and mid 1960s in humans who were presenting with symptoms of cold, of mild cold uh, to severe diseases. And it's also um, worth pointing out that the COVID-19, first cases of COVID-19 were reported in China last year. And it's not very clear as of now, uh, which animal this disease is being associated with or originated from. So a lot of research is but are currently uh, being carried out to be able to have more knowledge and understanding around this. Being a novel, a, a novel uh, disease and novel virus, a lot of interventions which we are being implemented right now are based on what, on the evidence which has been presented so far and the cases which have been managed so far. So we are the international community or government health specialists, public health specialists, scientists, researchers are quite new. Everybody is quite new to this. So we all have to learn and adapt uh, to work within the current or to stay safe within the current uh, era. So then what are the symptoms of uh, coronaviruses? And then we'll go specifically to the COVID-19 disease. So in general, uh, coronaviruses are respiratory viruses. That usually attack uh, or replicate in our airways and symptoms can vary from mild to very severe uh, case presentations and in mild cases you, you, you generally present with a uh, common common cold uh, while in severe cases uh, it um, presents with um, difficulty in breathing tiredness fever cough and it's been said that usually one in six persons would generally become very ill from the disease. So how are uh, coronavirus, generally coronaviruses are, uh, since they are respiratory, it means they will be generally being, that generally being transmitted either through droplets or aerosols or contact. 
uh, and in the case of COVID, it's been evidence as, as of now, the evidence which uh, is being presented sh shows that it's primarily been transmitted by droplets and by contact. By droplets, we mean particles which have been emitted from our mouth during when we are coughing, when we are speaking, when we are shouting at people. That is why part of the prevention measures are we have to ensure phys uh, physical or what they call social distancing from people. And uh, because the, part the particle size of the, uh, the, the droplet, the particle size is quite large for, of the droplets which have been emit emitted from um, the COVID, uh, the, the virus causing COVID the COVID-19 disease, um, it cannot travel beyond a distance of more than one meter generally. So that's why the recommendations are we keep a, a distance of one to two meters apart from, from each other, from each other. And um, uh, the second method in which the COVID-19 disease is being transmitted, as I earlier mentioned, is by contact. Contact um, in which, for example, you have objects being infected, being, you have droplets uh, dropping on infected, uh, infecting rather, droplets infecting objects which are being touched by us humans, who touch money. If, if I'm sick with the disease of, if, even if I'm not sick, if I'm a carrier, if, I, if I'm a carrier of the disease and, I'm, I'm, and, and I am not yet presenting with symptoms, uh, as of now, there's evidence which shows that asymptomatic patients can actually transmit also, actually infect and can actually transmit the, the virus. And um, so if the, Virus gets on surfaces, on money, uh, it has to touch our mouth, our nose, our eyes. Those are method, those are, um, means or mechanisms, uh, those are um, um, points of entry of the virus into our body. So that is why it's been also recommended that we even when speaking to each other, we keep a distance. And at the end of the day, we make sure we always have to um, um, practice hygiene measures, which we'll go into later on in the course of uh, our this presentation. So, um, like I earlier on said, this disease is quite new in our communities, in our society. So, for now, the, transmissions, the transmission measures are mainly through droplets. Which come out, which we emit from our mouth, and later on, learn on, on either on people or on objects which we use and touch, and later on, touch our face, our mouth, and our nose. So, but however, there is um, research is currently being, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of research being conducted around uh, aerosols being a possible uh, means through which. Um, the virus can be transmitted. That is why in some countries, some countries, you see the ministries of health advising that uh, their population make use of face masks to cover because they believe or they think that uh, the virus can as well be transmitted through aerosols, which are smaller particles, which are still being, which could still have still be emitted from our mouth, and these smaller particles travel long distances. So. Methods of prevention. One of the key methods which uh, is being advised is hand washing. Uh, a lot of us in our communities do not have the habit of constantly, frequently washing our hands. So now it's everybody, everybody, everybody is being called upon to frequently wash their hands. Even if we have to use um, uh, liquid-based disinfectants, hand sanitizers, it doesn't still take away or cancel the fact that we will still need to wash our hands at some point in the day. So hand sanitizers work effectively, but then we should, we should still remember to constantly wash our hands. And um, washing, our, washing our hands will require that we, we, totally, we, we take our time to wash in between our fingers, on the back of our hands, the tips of our, of our nails, our fingers, our wrists, 
making sure that all those areas taking time to properly scrub and apply soap on it to make sure that we're really washing out all uh, bacterial viruses on which we must have come in contact with. The next, uh, and in our communities now, we're also advising that most of our campaigns, which we conduct here in Boya and in Cameroon, we're, we're encouraging that offices, for those who are still working, who can still work offices, and um, uh, um, different institutions, even in our homes, we set up wash stations, so that we will have a hand sanitizer placed at strategic points within our offices or our homes. In markets, we're encouraging the local governments to set up wash stations just so that we get communities and people used to washing their and cleaning their hands. The next prevention measure is that of ensuring physical distance. I, I, I prefer calling it physical distancing as opposed to social distancing because personally I am of the opinion that we should be encouraging people to keep stay physically away from each other. However, being co stay uh, being connected socially because uh, it's been we've in, increasingly noticing a lot of mental health mental health issues coming up with uh, distancing measures which have been put in different countries, either quarantine or um, shutdowns. A lot of people are can't really support that, being uh, isolated from their loved ones, from their colleagues, all of that. So uh, it's from that perspective that I, I personally prefer referring to it as physical distancing as opposed to social distancing because I still believe that there is need for us to, be, to stay socially connected, just like we are connected now through Zoom, there are different methods which we could use to ensure that we are, physic we are socially connected to one another. So, with this particular prevention measure, what I'll be advising us is for our offices, uh, we, we reduce the number of staff who present to the office. So those countries that still advise people to turn up at off in offices, encourage teleworking, remote working as much as possible, and put in place uh, strategies which we could follow staff and colleagues to make sure that they are effectively working from home. For for services which actually require that people turn up to the office, uh, make sure you have your wash stations in place, set up the office, in, the, in re reset the office such that you ensure that physical distancing measure from one another and put in place a standard of a hygienic standard operating procedures which will guide the way colleagues interact in the, at, at the level of the office. For organizations or for people who have programs running in the field, this by this I'm also referring to um, humanitarian organizations that offer life-saving interventions to refugees, to internally displaced persons. You, it's quite important that we develop standard operating procedures in which we clearly explain what needs to be uh, put in place to ensure physical distancing at the level of the community because at most often, um, uh, our service provision sites are overcrowded with people. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's about time that we think of what we could do to limit people from coming on, on uh, from crowding at um, service provision sites. For example, in one of our distribution programs, food distribution program, because we have to feed people. We have to make sure that uh, these in, internally displaced persons get their uh, food rations for their families. So what we've done is, we, for example, we have, we, did, we, as opposed to inviting the whole community to turn up to receive their food rations, we have created calendars, which make sure that at no particular time, we have on site more than 50 people, and we have demarcation, we have ropes which we've used and some uh, sticks which we use to demarcate and make sure that we, we create that, um, that, um, that we clearly um, create marks which are demarcates and shows clearly shows where people have to be standing, uh, so that we are we are reassured that we are maintaining that uh, we are encouraging physical distancing within the community. And even at the, with the staff, with the distribution staff, we make sure that each person is quite separated from the 
from from the other setting up wash stations at service provision sites at the distribution sites and encouraging beneficiaries to wash their hands before collecting their their, their full rations and and of course i've mentioned this before touching avoid touching the face and the hands i think i saw um in one of this of the social media outlets somebody said telling people to respect or to the rule of telling people not to touch their hands and their face is more difficult than keeping the ten commandments so it was quite funny and i laughed at it i was like it's quite difficult it's, it's very difficult to tell people not to not even myself, I feel like always wanting to touch my, my nose, touching my mouth, all of that. So it's quite tempting. But then we need to practice. It comes with practice. We need to practice and make sure that since we have that tendency of always touching, clean our hands and test our hands, wash our hands regularly. And um, the last prevention measure, measure I also want to highlight here is that of being staying up to date with the trends and information in our countries. and at global level is quite important and there's a lot of information out there uh, uh in the in, in the in the media a lot of which majority of which are false uh and false information usually goes more rapid and spreads wider than the correct information so it's quite imp important for us civil society advocates act, act, uh, activists humanitarian workers development workers to stay up to date with the current trends so that it helps us with strategies. For now, we still have operation, food distribution operations ongoing in communities um, that are affected by conflict. And for us, it's quite important to stay up to date because it helps me to be able to know when to say, no, this is the red line. You can't go anymore. Or I'll be able to say preposition early and ahead of time. I could be able to redirect our operations and say, instead of giving one month food ration, we give three months food ration and encourage the IDPs to stay in their homes. So all of that is quite important. And it's quite important that we get credible information from credible institutions like the World Health Organization and other uh, international accredited bodies, UNICEF, uh, the International Red Cross and uh, other reputable institutions who give out correct and credible information okay and most importantly also we encourage it is, I, I encourage that we we listen and follow the advice of uh, ministries of health uh, health practitioners uh, health providers it's quite important that we listen to we get their their advice now um one thing i would want to highlight is before ending my session of presentation is in this current era women are more vulnerable or at risk of uh, getting infected and the burden of the current pandemic is being felt more by women because primarily women, women make up 70 percent of uh, health workforce so this will mean most majority of health workers people will be, who will be caring for sick people for people with covid will be or are women and this means that it places all at, 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 at a much higher level of vulnerability of being infected that's the first thing and also even within our families women are the, are the primary caregivers within homes so if we have cases of um COVID in our communities because at, uh, uh, um i think i didn't mention this the COVID, the COVID, the COVID-19 disease has an incubation period of close to 14 days and averagely between five to six days. So most people who come across or be, will be infected with the disease will not present with symptoms or may present with very mild symptoms, which uh, most often will require home care. And in, the, in, the, in our homes, the first caregivers are women, our mothers, our aunties, even us ourselves will be the first people to react to want to provide care to our children, our loved ones within our homes. And this also places us at a much higher level of vulnerability at, and risk as well. Uh, lastly, majority of uh, women, especially in low and middle income country, rely solely on the, on 
on the work they do on a daily basis, be, be it their businesses, be it their farms, to be able to feed their children and their families. And so um, for countries who, that are instituting shutdown, this wastes a lot of women because it will mean the poor woman, the ordinary woman, will not be able to go to her farm, will not be able to, able to go about her normal business, to be able to fend and support her children. So this will have an indirect or direct um, uh, burden on women. Psychology, it's going to play on us psychologically. It's going to play on us physically. Because even if uh, in our cases, the government will say they will support in providing food, but in most instances, it's not enough to feed the homes that women usually feel, uh, feed on a daily basis. So, so all of that, and which means most women will be tempted not to respect the shutdown rules. This means most people will, not be, will be tempted not to respect the shutdown rules. And they'll go and they'll rather sacrifice and go out to their farms to look for food for their children, rather than staying at home and allowing their children to die of hunger. And all of these things places them at the level of, at the higher risk and vulnerability than compared to the, to the men. Um, and I want to conclude on, uh, uh, by saying that it is our responsibility as women leaders, as young, as young, young leaders, to seek for ways to contribute in continuing the spread of the virus. There's a lot going out there in the community. We have we, we belong to WhatsApp groups where we receive a lot of false information, and it's up to us to debunk these myths, to contribute in debunking these myths, and help in sharing the right prevention measures help in sharing the right information about COVID. Most people do not know what the disease is actually, even though we claim to know that to know what the disease is. And also contribute in supporting our surveillance system in our countries. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions if um I didn't touch on an area which you want you wanted me to touch on. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Anne, for sharing so much insight as to what this means for women. Um, also, understanding the virus, how it spread, what it actually means in scientific terms. For those of us who just hear um, the word coronavirus without necessarily understanding them. Um, um, we just mentioned, as everybody else is joining, if you can just drop, quickly drop your name. Um, and your country so that we can do a shout out and hello. Uh, most of you's videos are unfortunately have been disabled. We would like to see everybody's face when we say hello to you, at least so that you, we can see how happy you are to be on our call. Um, I'm glad we have Fatma with us now from Tanzania. She's at AWLF, Africa Women Leadership Forum chapter chair for Tanzania. She has been able to join us. And Ruth Tabe from Cameroon as well. Um, we, we lost them earlier on the call, but we're glad, we're really excited that they're back. Um, so I'm not sure I can, Fatma, can you please enable your video and unmute yourself and share with us your insights on what it feels like. Um, from Tanzania. Fatma, we can't see you. Ruth, please, can you also put okay. on your video just so that I'm sure you're on? Hello, can you see me now? I'm not sure. Hmm? What's no. wrong with my yeah, video? right now I can see you. Yeah, I can see you. Hi, Fatma. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm really sorry I'm late for the meeting. I didn't know the time schedule for here. So, um, our updates on uh, coronavirus, especially in Tanzania, have been increasing. We've had uh, from one case going to almost 20 cases right now and we've lost one of our brothers a Tanzanian person has died so it's kind of sad for us and uh, when we look at uh, we give a view on the women and on the issue of the coronavirus I think that uh, 
there is a very big risk of women being affected, um, not only from their mentally, from also health issues, and also in family and income levels. Because um, we have lots of women here, uh, like very like are the ones like taking care of their families, the ones that are economically supporting families, they are supporting and working in different sectors also. Lots of nurses in hospitals, doctors, and in various occupations are women. So with this virus, I think we have been very affected. Like I'm going to take example of myself. I had this nursery school. So since all schools are closed, we cannot operate. So a lot of business have been affected and um, a lot of occupations have been affected. So I think um, if this keeps on, it's really going to affect more businesses and we really don't know when everything's going to get better. We're just staying hopeful and praying. So I think that's simple and brief updates from here. Great. Thank you so much, oh, Fatima. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to do like a quick shout out to everyone who's on the call. We have Catherine Jumbe from Cameroon slash Nigeria. <laughs> we have Santa Bacham from Cameroon. Hello, Santa. Um, we have Agovera from Cameroon. Hi. We have Itamba Dick. Um, Etaba Abondip from Cameroon, living in the UK. Um, hi, Etamba. We have Henny or Mark Edomwande. Edomwande. I hope I pronounced that word, Henny. Please don't shoot me. <laughs> from Nigeria. Uh, we have Justine Kengbeza Taku from Cameroon, that she's based in Switzerland. Hi, Justine. Um, we have Immaculate Atigeriaga. Kenyan living in Switzerland, if I got that right. Hi. And we have Mafway Fortune from Cameroon. We have Samuel from Nigeria. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. If you're on the call, just drop in the message, your name and where you're from so that we can do a nice welcome and shout out on behalf of the African Women Leadership Forum. Um, I think we have Ruth, um, our African Women Leadership Chapter Chair for Cameroon on this call. Ruth, are you here? Hi, Ruth, can you hear us? Ruth, I think you're... I think your your screen is upside down. We're just gonna give Ruth a moment. We can see your hi Ruth, we can see your your house, maybe, not too sure. But welcome to the call. Okay, there you are, Ruth. And yeah, hi again, Fatma from Tanzania. Fatma just is the one who just spoke. So Ruth, we'd like to hear from you. Catherine actually shared some insights earlier on um, Cameroon, but in this session, we'd like to take the opportunity for you to just share what you have been doing so far in your area to, um, to handle the coronavirus scare that is going on. So maybe you can briefly share with us like two minutes and then we move to the next session. Ruth, we can't hear you. I'm not sure. I think we lost Ruth. Um, he Ruth, hello. Also, if you are just joining us, welcome to the African Women Voices on Coronavirus. The aim of this call is to um, shed insight on what the coronavirus means, how it's affecting us as women, what we can do, what we shouldn't do, um, basic tips on how to survive this period, and the impact the virus is having on our various homes, our various units, outlets, work, businesses in general. So if you're just joining us, welcome to the call. And that said, we're going to probably take a few questions. If you have any questions for 
for Miss Lindsay Ann. She shared some information, very vital information on on the on the virus and what it means in for us as a community. So if you have any questions, please. Yeah, I see some people have raised their hands. Um, so Jaran J, come for say, please. Yep, you can go ahead and ask a question, please. Hello, Velvita. I just wanted to say hello. I'm listening in and I'm not going to be participating. So before you take your questions, I just wanted to say a big shout out to all of you and congratulations on this effort. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Um, Justine, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I decided to shut down my video because um, I'm not Kent, <laughs> you know, with the lockdown. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, we are. Okay. With the lockdown, you just jump up from bed and you sit on your computer and you're working. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I will call you Madam Lindy. You did share a lot of information. As I mm -hmm. said, myself, I'm Cameroonian. I have my family living back home. I mean, everybody from my side is still home and we are really concerned on the, the cases that we see every day that are rising. Like this morning, I woke up and I saw it's already up to 200 and something cases with around six deaths already. And I also saw a video from Limbe from my own city where a case was confirmed. And my only worry on that video was the, the, the supposed um, person came from abroad and he maybe he, he was living in this, uh, in, in, he has been living I mean, with people around the city and had some symptoms is that, that they, they took to the hospital. But the worry is, how can they take a test in Limbe and have to send to Yawunde for results? I mean, how long does this kind of, uh, I don't know how long the, the test might take, but I think it's, it's it, for, my, for my part, it doesn't really show seriousness on how to combat this disease. And talking about the lockdown as well, I don't really know if I have to, I'm asking a question or it's my own point of view because on the society, I mean, in Africa, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really Africa as a whole. I also watched a video this morning, a, a woman from Nigeria that was crying, talking about the lockdown, because if we, are, we want to really maintain the social distancing that I'm talking about, the physical distancing, you should be able to sit in the comfort of your home and be able to do the little things that you can do without really getting worried. I think about maybe like the banking sector, for example. If in Africa, somebody needs to go get money for food, you need to go to the bank, you need to do with physical cash and everything. And you sit at home, like for example, in Limbe, I had my family in Limbe for like every day, they have, they don't have light. So how do you feel that people will live in their houses comfortably without going out? So it's really baffling me how the government as, as a whole, I know with the, um, with the local organizations, we try to do our best on our own part, but I think the chunk of the chunk of the work is still depends on the government because I was talking this morning with one one guy. I said, if the government can't even afford like to give these these women or this this local these vulnerable people the least amenities to be able to 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 sustain during this period, there is no way a woman who only goes to the farm to pluck out uh, potatoes to, to feed her family, who stay back home for two weeks without any food. It's really difficult. And I don't really see how the government is trying to really, I mean, to, 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 to make the situation a better one. I don't know, maybe from your own point as uh, a health specialist, maybe you, you have different or you see it in a different light or something that I might not understand from the field, which is, um, maybe my help because I would also like to know I have an organization that is back home which I try on my own little level but I think as, as I said organizations at the end of the day we can't do everything by ourselves I think the government also has a very big part to play on this nice. okay 
Thanks, thanks so much. Um, um, and before you jump right into that, um, we do are going to try as much as possible to take recommendations on different issues and understanding that this call is a global call and it has people from different areas. So we just so happen to have a lot of people or most of the people addressing the subject from Cameroon. However, some of them might not understand um, some of the names that we're calling because you know some of these places are not places they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So if you would just ask your question direct, you know, so that um, based on the information that um, and shared and then maybe if like um send us like a, a message on the group so we can capture that and do special recommendation and, and answer and response session we're going to be trying to capture challenges as well so okay. if you have any other chat yeah like challenge i noticed that you know you've tabled out quite some challenges um thanks justin for that so we're going to try to capture those and see whether those are challenges that are faced across different countries and see um, the methods that are being used in different areas. Maybe they are, they might, they just might be some, some learning we can do from other countries and they will share their insight as well on that. So yeah. go ahead Anne, and just uh, quickly respond to that so we can hop on to the next session. Uh, okay. Thank you very much uh, to the lady who asked the question. I'm sorry. I I, I would not be able to master all the names, but then thank it's you very okay, much. It's okay, she's <laughs> Okay. Um, actually, uh, your concerns are well placed, and they are the concerns which most Cameroonians actually are asking and are, have been voicing out to the government and the people in positions of authority. However, it, although the government has its own role, which it must play in the containment, in containing the spread of this disease, each one of us also has a role to play. Because there are a lot of things which we'll need to do to support all the containment measures which are, are required to make sure that the, the, the virus is, um, is brought under control, is spread, spread under control. You made reference to banking yes for example our banking systems are still very very are not very electronical and it requires that people go to the banks for example every day to collect money it's our responsibility to make sure that when we go to the bank we have our sanitizers we make sure that we don't touch people we don't greet people if people are overcrowded in the bank you wait outside so it, it calls for self-consciousness and self-awareness such that we are all contributing to the global good okay and we have a lot of um, practices and behaviors at community level that are not encouraging either. You made mention of the case that came from abroad to, to Limbe. Um, how many people did actually notify authorities that this is a case that is supposed to be quarantined? It's not that the person was sick, but this is somebody who just came back and somehow, somehow is not quarantined. How many people did take it as their personal responsibility to say, no, this person has to be kept aside? Within the family, the families are, will be hiding the information. In the communities, when people are even presenting with symptoms right now, if you're having cold, if you're having cough and fever, you, many people will not want to present themselves to the hospital. But then, we, we, and we, at this level, we will, not want the, we will not expect the government to, to do the magic or to do magic and fish out people from the community who are presenting with symptoms or people who are who run away from being quarantined. So it's also our responsibility in as much as the government has its own role. It's quite true, many people have been voicing concerns that the government is not doing enough, but then we should also be aware that we have a very weak health system prior to this crisis. So with the, with the coming of this outbreak or this, this additional crisis to, the, to, to Cameroon, it has overboard it. It's bringing in a lot of uh, extra burden on an already weak health system, which was already weak prior to the, the crisis. So it's a lot of things which, not just Cameroon, but our African and low and middle income countries will have to face because most of our health systems were weak prior to this. And it required concerted and global, a whole systems approach to be able to beat COVID in Africa. It will require a whole system and a holistic approach where everybody feels and knows that they have a responsibility to contribute towards containing this virus, the spread of the virus. Thank you.
All right. Thank Hi, you so Fatma. much. Fatma has a question. Can you just drop in your questions? I think moving forward, what we'll do is if you have a question, maybe you just drop it in because we're <laughs> running a little behind on time. You can just drop it on, on the comment section and so that by the time we're closing the call, we have all questions ready and the respondents or whoever is meant to answer the question can immediately um, prepare to take that question. Catherine as well from Cameroon seems to have a question. So please guys, if you can just write out your question as well in the comment section, we will be able to capture that and just specify to whom maybe you want the question to be, to um, whoever you want to answer this question or you can just ask it and we'll know um, as one of our speakers will respond to that. So we're, we've all understood um, what the virus is about and, and how it can potentially spread. Somebody just mentioned that um, I then some people don't even know how to identify or how to identify or or to or, or, or identify the symptoms or I or even know if they have been affected um, by this virus. So um, I know that we're not supposed to be going through directly to um, um, Dr. Itamba. But we're going to just ask Dr. Itamba to just take on that, uh, maybe, and explain to us how this virus in itself, um, um, how we can identify um, um, or know exactly what the symptoms are, what are the early symptoms. If you can rapidly take us through that, Dr. Itamba will be glad. Um, all right, thank you, Velvita, for giving me the opportunity to talk about the signs and symptoms of the coronavirus. So um, generally, viruses have specific signs and symptoms that they present with. And in the case of the coronavirus, people who are affected by this virus will present with symptoms like um, a cough, which is a dry cough. It's not a productive cough. So you might have a dry cough. You might present with a runny nose. Some, um, some people might be sneezing. Others present with a fever and a headache. So those are the main symptoms which can prompt you to think that you might have the coronavirus. So a dry cough, fever, headache, runny nose, and sneezing. Those are the main symptoms which are um, indicative of the coronavirus. And usually, if you present with any of those symptoms and you have come in contact with somebody who has the virus or somebody who has um, come from a country where there's a high rate of the coronavirus, it should be um, very, um, it will be very likely that you have the virus. So if you have any of those symptoms, each country has um, a toll free number that you can call to notify the health authorities that you're having symptoms suggestive of the coronavirus and they will come and attend to you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Itamba. We've all identified so far how this can spread, um, the symptoms, the potential symptoms to look out for. And now because we're having a conversation with women across the African continent, I know a lot of people have been worried. What does this really mean for us? Um, people are already started highlighting what it's going to do to families. What of those who don't have, you know. So we have a large group of people who are going to be affected by this economically, psychologically, you can name it. And women are at the forefront, like we said, of of the impact of this virus, regardless of how or whichever angle we look at it. So we're trying to, in our next session, we're going to be looking at the impact um, this virus has on women. And we're going to be listening to Santa Bacham. She's a PR specialist from Cameroon. She's going to be giving us, you know, the impacts of the virus, this, this virus can have on businesses. So Santa, we'd like to hear from you. Hi Santa and welcome. Um, hi, Velvita. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing great. Um, first of all, I'm Santa Bacham, as Velvita will rightly say. Um, I'm a PR, should I say, personally professional. Um, I reside in Cameroon, and um, I'll start with myself. It's been a big hit on my business, because for obvious reasons, um, with PR, you get to do a lot of... Um, get to take care of a lot of events, you get to um, run campaigns, seminars, and conferences. And because one of the prevention methods that was, that was prescribed was 
social distancing so people can't come together you can't be people can't be in a room of more than 50 people so it's been it's taken a toll on my business because i had we had like four um, events lined up throughout the year and now nothing so as a woman and with i'll start with the pr sector uh, with a lot of majority of women um occupy the pr sector majority of women occupy the communication sector and so it's businesses especially if you own a, a, a company everybody is staying at home so eventually we don't have we don't have anything to work on so um in that aspect it's a big 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 hit on businesses and have to take that way we have to keep on paying but then there is no source of income so there's only an outflow and not an inflow of cash that's for one so um regarding businesses i'll try to situate your mind in what you know what the business in africa looks like in terms of the general and then in terms of, of women so um i have a, an excerpt here from uh, the world bank director of strategy and operations for the african region uh, there I took Gaye, and he says, Africa is the only region in the world where women than men choose to become entrepreneurs, a phenomenon that is not subject of adequate discussion. Expanding the opportunities for female entrepreneurs through policies that foster gender equality would have a tremendous impact on Africa's growth. Simple and inexpensive solutions have been proven effective and should be adopted on a wide scale. We have many female entrepreneurs in the informal sector. The issue is enabling them. An enabling environment is key. That is the only way for the continent to absorb its educated and entrepreneurial people. So what does this mean? So because we, first of all, statistics say uh, the more, there are more women than men in the world, right? And so now we have a uh, guy telling us about, you know, the women choosing more, there are more women who choose to become entrepreneurs than men. Meaning, be it in the formal or informal sector, right? Um, women are thriving. Women are at the forefront of everything. If you want to check the formal sector, right? Although we are less entrepreneurs in the formal sector, but then where you find the most female entrepreneurs in the informal sector, because we are in Africa and what we basically live on is, um, let's say agriculture, right? You find most women in agriculture doing nursing jobs, um, being cashiers at shops, um, into petty trade, um, you know, in the markets, selling food. You Majority of the people sell food in the market are female. Um, you go to offices, the sectaries, majority females. And now we have this whole, this tiny invisible virus that says the world stop and everything is stopped, you know. And what becomes of these people who basically live on this means, you know, and some, many of them are not even registered, right? Because getting into, into business, in, I'll take, for example, in Cameroon, the taxes are crazy. So they prefer to go into informal, you know, business. And this is their only source of income. And they are told, ordered by the government without any measures put in place that they should stay at home. So what becomes of their businesses. So you can already see the effects and the impact it's having on these petty traders. For example, Cameroon has, Cameroon actually 60% of Cameroon's economy is dependent on, 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 on the, on the micro, micro businesses. And majority of these micro businesses are run by women. What are those who, for example, we've been, we've been um, in, in such an entrepreneurial darkness for a very long time where in recent years in, in the last four or five years we've begun we've begun to to emerge to to get into the entrepreneurial spotlight and you know young people coming up and seeing that oh there are no jobs in the in the in the, in the civil in the in the government or anything have come out to say okay we can do businesses online we can um sell clothes we can sell shoes whatever online without having to pay taxes without having to pay anything all we just need to do is retail and sell online but you understand that from where they get the clothes from where they get the shoes from where they get the whatever they are selling they can't get that because there is no import because borders have been blocked nothing is coming in yeah. china is delivering 
And so it, it plays a huge, huge toll on their business because where do they get to replenish? Nobody's trying to buy clothes right now because everybody's trying to buy food to survive. Nobody's trying to, to buy makeup, you know, things. Nobody's trying to buy. And most of these online, you know, entrepreneurs and um, retail vendors are female. So you can see where, you know, it's impacting businesses. If people who survive just on that, and they survived well because it was a, it's a well-paying industry in, 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 in Cameroon. I wouldn't even say for Cameroon because when you check other countries, you see that many people now are thriving off of online businesses, off of online retail, that social media, I call it, oh, I'll, the way I call it, I say social media um, retail. They aren't surviving because there is no new product coming and nobody's trying to buy you know, things now, everybody's just trying to buy food to survive, you know, this pandemic. So it, it's a huge blow, especially on the, on the micro businesses. I wanted even to, let, let's move on to the agricultural sector. Most of, um, because Cameroon here, we survive on, on most um, people of low income survive on subsistence farming. Now they are told to remain indoors. How do they farm? How do they go to the farm to cultivate the crops? Because once they cultivate to survive, for starters, and they cultivate to also provide for us to feed. So if they don't go to the farms because they've been told to stay indoors, how do we feed? How does, you know, how does the food reach us? So it's a whole chain that is being affected by this virus because why we are staying indoors? We can't do anything. Or take, for example, according to recent research, sometimes yes. highest female labor participation rate compared to the regions including Europe and North America. However, looking closely at the type of jobs will reveal less of a rosy picture. So it's already a bad picture for us because as females, we, we get into the labor force, we get into more than men do in, in, in sub-Saharan sub Africa. Now it's a case where, okay, it's low income, yes. Okay, we were surviving on the low income. Now it becomes like an almost a negative income because you can't go out to do what you, you were doing before because they stay indoors. So it's a huge problem for businesses in Africa. I think majority of the governments in Africa thrive on micro businesses because how many parasitals are there? How many you can count the counties that live on? You have Nigeria, you have South Africa, you have Kenya. You have on, on, on companies, but then, but then like the countries, what do they live on? It's micro is the micro businesses that make the company make the country thrive. And they are also the biggest employers, you know. So it, when you look at the, and then we, we're going out to the formal, those who are living in the formal sector, you have those who work in the hotels, the cooks. We don't have anybody coming in now because everybody has been told to stay in their country and stay put. Who, who, they don't have jobs. Majority of the cooks in hotels are female. So they don't have jobs right now. And are they paid? I don't know. I'm not, I, since I don't work there, I don't know how it's been done. But you see that already, their passion is taken away for starters, number one. And number two, if they don't work, is the, do they get paid? Because the company also has to survive. So it's a case where people are really drowning in, in this. You have restaurants. Majority of the restaurants here in my country are being run by women. So, you know, what happens? No customers because everybody is staying home now to eat. Um, the workers, majority of the workers are also female. Nobody gets paid because there's no customers. There's nothing going on. The bars, you have the, the cashiers at shops. Right now, the shops might be the only thriving business because everybody is willing to go and buy and stay home. But then again, it's a case of, you know, they have to limit the, you know, the number of, of people. And then they have to, like, the ships, ships have to use and everything because you have to close by six. Obviously, if you're being paid by the hour, that's your income being, you know, tampered with. And... This is something that, uh, and I see that invisible virus is, is drowning the world today. And it's unimaginable. It's, it's, it's annoying. It's, it's heartbreaking to see that this is actually happening. Also, I will go to, what about weddings? I mean, weddings, things that people look out for. You know, majority of, of those who own event companies in this country, in my country, I can't say, I can't say for, for the rest of the world, but I, I feel it's a feeling that, these people are women because, I mean, they know how to make places look nice, decor and everything. It's being stopped because nobody can do any wedding. I was supposed to FC at three weddings. Now everything is in because 
you know, people can gather to celebrate love and this is impeding on their income. It's impeding on the business. It's impeding on, on their livelihood, the feeling. Everything has been stopped. So it's this coronavirus thing, it, it gets me so angry to the point where I, sometimes I just have to laugh and say, <laughs> I think, I don't know, it really, it's really, uh, I, without even thinking, weddings, caterers, those who provide the food during the wedding, those who do the, I mean, everybody, it's a whole chain of stop, you know, nobody's doing anything. What about those who own boutiques, those who do the imports and exports of, of furniture? Nobody can receive anything because you don't know. It's, it's like, it's, uh, the way I describe it is like, you just receive news that your, your ship capsized in the sea, right? Your, sh your ship of goods capsized in the sea. And it's, it's something that will take you by, oh my God, shock, right? Because if, what if you borrowed money to, you know, to really finance, pre-finance this um, import and you import and they tell you, oh, ships can come in because coronavirus. How are you going to make the, and then they stop you from working, close down places. How are you going to make that money? How, like, I'm trying to understand how are you going to make that money to, you know, reimburse the pre-finance, the, the finance that you receive to pre-finance the business. Like, how is it going to work out? All of this, as um, um, Lundy rightly said, it plays on psychology, it plays on your own livelihood, and it's a case where everybody is just, you know, as they say, terre à terre in, in, in French. Not even, not to talk about the travel companies. I mean, those are the people you had um, here in, in, in Cameroon, you have the, the bus services where majority of the hostesses, in fact, all of the hostesses are female. Now they say stop movement. How many of those, of those females get to work again? It's, it's, it's like a whole, like I think we are suffering the most. They say the men contracted more, but the women are suffering the most from the effects of the virus. And this is, this is something that we have to really you know, look at and say, oh, this is really bad because it, it, I'm not trying to be, to be gender biased or anything, but then if you look at those who run the big cars, they tell the big companies, they're they, they men, you know, so they still get to get, you know, a little bit of here and there, but then those who are, you know, at the bottom chain are the females, are, so they feel the impact more. And so um, I, I also go to, to those who are not affected or who are slightly affected by, by, by this pandemic. I'll, I'll talk about those in tech. Those in tech, are, they've been, it's like they saw the future and, you know, they can't work from anywhere because if they're coding, they're coding on their laptops. If, if they're designing new models, they're doing it on their laptop. All they need is a laptop, internet, and probably some good music. So those people are the people actually, I mean, tech women, are, I'm sure they are, they're thriving most because they don't like noise. They like, you know, being you know in, the, in a comfy nice space to work so the tech women i'll say you know are probably the ones who are who are slightly affected not that not to a greater extent also nurses and doctors although their lives are at risk you you realize that majority of the nurses we have around the world are female and so you know their lives are at risk but then they, they still get to work and they still get to provide for their families but then it's a case of your life is at risk, you're liable to die. And so what of what use is making the money, you know? So it, it affects, you know, the nurses in that aspect, you know, the female nurses. And we, we also have um, shop owners, you know, some women also own shops and all, it, it's open because now everybody's rushing to buy shops. Everybody's rushing to buy, to, sorry, to buy uh, items in the shop. So it's open. It's open to a certain extent because when you get into those shops, the earlier majority, if not all of the cashiers are female. Um, another sector where you also have, um, um, you also have females that are being affected is the bank, the banking sector. You would agree with me that majority of the tellers in, in majority of the banks are female, and so they have reduced. They have, it's literally a case where they have to reduce um, their working hours in order to, you know, have what they call social distancing, and so they only work on certain days and in shifts. And so I don't know how their their internal policies work, but then is it a case where 
you know, their salaries are tampered with, but then I'll always judge more on their passion for their job. That is being tampered with because you can't tell someone who loves their job to sit at home, sit at home and really do work because if you're a tenant at the bank, your workspace is at the bank to be able to do work, to be able to serve people. It's, it's a service. So how staying at home really impedes on their psychology on, you know, having to do their job that they love with so much passion. And one big factor that is going to probably really play on, on or change the, 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 the face of, of business around the world, Africa here, is, is the taxes. So those we females who own taxes, because obviously women are not only business owners, they play a major role, majority of women are mothers and, you know, and also have to homeschool the kids, right? And so you have homeschool your kids, you be, you're being bothered about this virus that has blocked this business that was supposed to bring in this amount so that things, so it's a whole cycle, it's, it's a whole blow and a whole bomb on a person, on the female, right? Because men, as we know men, <laughs> men are just, you know, the beings, you know, they are just there to play with the kids, have them, you know, play, play. But then when it comes down to the real thing, as in homeschooling, it's always dependent on the mom. It's always dependent on the woman. And so what about the woman who is being worried about, you know, not making enough to be able to do certain things around the house because her business has been shut down? And at the end of the day, she has to pay taxes. And she's paying taxes when she hasn't worked. So how does all that come into? Because Cameroon has, a, I'll take, I always, I'll take my country as an example. I'm sorry because this is it's a system where people have to be, to be cognizant of how do we like literally we pay 52 percent in profits in taxes in this country. And so imagine if you've not been your your shop or your business has been stopped throughout this period. How do you get to pay the 52 percent? And they'll ask for it. I'm telling you, they will ask for it, and you just have to give it. So it's it's a whole process where it's like they say, America, you know, sneezes and we catch a cold. We've caught the cold as females because it impedes on us more, first of all, because if children are home, we have to school them. If we run businesses, then we are thinking about how to pay people, how to pay taxes. How am I going to reimburse this? How am I going to do that? So in a, in a nutshell, we, we suffer the most, but then it's a time where we have to reach out to each other and hold hands and say, hey, it's going to be fine. Let's move on. Let's combat this thing together. Let's share information that is going to be able to, to help us. And this is where I always say we need women in the government. We need women in the formal sector. We need women who are decision makers who can sit in rooms and say, hey, this is what is happening. This is the analysis of what is happening. How do we do to help these women? How do we do to help the women? How do we do to even help citizens going through this thing? Because I'm telling you, Places have been shut down, but there is no contingency plan on how they are going to help people, business owners. And this is where we are. Places have been shut down. That's all we know. But then what happens to people who need to go out to feed and who can't do that anymore because of an invisible thing that we can't see? So that ends my presentation. Thank you so much, Shanta. Thank you so much, Shanta. has shared quite some insights on how this will affect businesses. Um, small businesses as well as large enterprises. She's equally shared a lot of insight on her country and what this means for people who are struggling to make um, ends, um, ends meet. Um, and we know that obviously there are a lot of people who have been affected by this. And yeah, women are at the forefront and that is exactly why we're having this call because we want to be able as women to take out uh, our issues, to table out what this would really mean for us, to table out um, potential solutions if we can find, or just, you know, um, working methods to go around during this time. Um, Santa's session was on um, the impact that the virus has on businesses. So if anybody has any questions, would you just raise your hand or drop in the question so Santa can um respond to that we're just gonna give like a, a two minutes to have everybody else drop in their questions so that she can quickly respond before we move on
Any questions, guys? Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll have Santa just um, look at the comment section. So people are going to most likely drop their questions and then she, we can answer that. Um, I see a question come in on, by when do you foresee commerce taking place again? Some sources say 12 months. Um, I feel, I feel it's, it's, as I rightly said, 12 months, but then you have, um, those who have, you have, uh, you know, the countries where people just want to get back in the game and start doing, but then they have to come to the reality and to the term, you know, that this thing has really, you know, strained, you know, even business relationships, if you, if you know what I mean, because everybody's concerned about themselves. So it's a case where you need to prepare your mind, prepare, <laughs> if you had workers, if you had staff, you have to prepare their minds as well. And then you have to get back into that process of, okay, say, getting the books ready. Like, okay, but you can get that before the 12 months, yeah? And trying to see, okay, this is where we've learned that this is what we need to do. This is how we need to do it. And, you know, get that gradual process. But then it's a lot of work because people are still trying to get out of, you know, that era of like, you know, we're living, you know, a chill, relaxed, you know, at our own pace, life and everything. But then I, I, I'll say 12 months, sometimes even more, because it now is no longer like a, a business. It's as, as the doctor writes, it's now a psychological thing where they have to get themselves ready and to get, you know, yourself ready, you know, to get back into, you know, hustling, in quotes, real hard. Uh, it's going to take, you know, 12, if not 12, I would say 12 to 18, 18 months, 12 to 18 months. To answer your question, um, is that? Yeah, I'll say 12, 12 to 18 months. Um, taxes are on what you earn. Taxes, yes. Determine amount, 52% of zero is zero, right? Or is there a different system? Okay, so Ruth, um, let me, let me, let me try to, to tell you what, what is up. I'll use, obviously, I'll use, oh, I love my country, but they annoy me, yeah? I'll try to use my example, right? So in the first year of business, they say you're tax-free, but somehow you still have to declare your tax and pay. So it's a case where even if you get businesses, right, even if you get um, whatever it is, because they monitor your, your bank, obviously, they monitor your statements and all of that. I have a free year, but then still I have to declare taxes and pay. If not, I get, you know, you know, build on back taxes. So I don't know how they do their calculations. And it's a case where it's non-debatable because the tax, the tax officers and have like a whole say over whatever law that there is. So they look at, I don't know how they do, I really don't know how they do it, but then they'll bring up, you know, bills and say, oh, you, you, you have this, you know, in the books and you need to pay. For example, what if, um, um, okay, those who have online businesses, yeah, they don't pay any taxes, but those who are registered, like, okay, like banks and everything, those who are registered, um, I would say, let me, let me give a typical example. Okay, co fine, communications agencies. If they give me a job right now, right, online, it's COVID, none of my staff is working. Nobody, none of my colleagues, my partners, none of us are working. But then it's online and we have to do, we'll pay the tax. Either ways, either ways, but we have a free year, we'll pay it. And so these are the things that, you know, there's a whole tax reform that needs to come into place. I'm thinking on behalf of my country, not on anybody's country, right? It's a whole tax reform. I hope that this helps the government to see actually that hey this is happening we have to you know fix things as quickly yeah. as possible so thank you so much santa we're going to now listen to peniel from nigeria peniel would like to share with us the impact this has on corporate women in particular um or obviously small businesses especially from nigeria where i think more than half of the population in nigeria owns or runs a business what this means is that if we're talking about the impact this would have on 
business owners on people who are corporate um, owner, uh, people who are in corporate world, what this would mean for people in the corporate world as well. Because we know that there is quite, um, that's a very highly populated country. So um, maybe you can just quickly tell us what this would mean um, for people in the corporate world overall, people who are trying to venture into entrepreneurship and their businesses have probably just collapsed and now they have to fall back to a nine to five job. And what this means really, because I mean, I know that some institutions are still open to working from home, but what, what, what do you think in your opinion is um, the impact this would have on people or corporate working women? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Santa said a whole lot because the effect on entrepreneurs also is the effect on the corporate working woman. Um, one, like she said, she talked about depletion of passion. So um, somehow, I personally am in the middle. I run the business. I also work as HR director for an organization and it's not been funny. So there are a lot of, um, you, it's, it's easy for people. So in the past two weeks, there about, I've heard a lot of people talk about go online, make sure your business is online, make sure your business is online. And I'm like, okay, everybody chill. How many of us can take everything online? First, a lot of people are affected. Oh, sorry, please. My daughter just went. That's exactly one of the reasons <laughs> so that's part why of the problem. on this call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the reality. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sick. So, <laughs> a lot, number one, passion for me. Yeah, she's giving me, she's giving me her sweets. <laughs> so, number one, Passion is because a lot of us, even though we're not doing our own business, a lot of us are passionate about what we do. Like Santa said, no matter what you're doing, we find fulfillment in what we're doing. Take it away from an African woman who is trying to break out from the who is trying to break out from the norms of sit at home, and you're choking her. That's the truth. You're choking her. She has found fulfillment in meeting people outside, in interacting with people outside, and now you're telling her, come back home. <laughs> it's not funny. Um, so they're having, to, they're having to deal with that. There's the, there's the depletion of passion. You're not even sure that your jobs are still there waiting for you, like Santa said. Now, I, I, I help a particular organization um, deal with their HR issues. And part of the things we've been saying is there's going to be a cut down. You, it's not, it's, it's unavoidable. It's inevitable. A lot of people are not just going to lose their jobs. A lot of people have lost their jobs. So what are we going to do? So a lot of women out there, there's a loss of job. There's a loss of, you're taking away their fulfillment, their passion. There's the, there's, there's going to be, if, there's going to be the mental breakdown. Let me use myself as an example. I've had to be conscious to do certain things, not to feel choked. So one of the reasons I left, I, I, I stay in Lagos, Nigeria. I had to leave Lagos, Nigeria to come to Abia State to stay with my parents. So that when I'm telling my daughter, shush, stay away. There's somebody else she can run to because I need to also breathe. I need, I need space. Now, it's not like we love our children. We want to spend time with them, but 24 hours a day, no, we need a break. So a lot of people are going to suffer. That's the truth. A lot of people are going to suffer. There are going to be a very high increase in health, uh, mental health issues. Depression, it's, it's funny that before this started, before this started, we had a lot of, a lot of, we had an increase. There was a rise in depression, there was a, light, a rise in uh, mental health issues, a rise in suicide rates. 
to me, it just felt like it was introducing us to the realities of what this time would be. If we're not careful, a lot of people are going to start from depression, not just depression. People are going to have panic attacks. People are going to have panic attacks. People are going to have anxiety attacks. People are going to have... People are going to feel claustrophobic. I'm alone in my house. How do I deal with that? So it's, it's, it's a whole lot, ranging from mental health issues, loss of job. You don't know what today holds, how much more tomorrow. You're not even sure. Even if, so the, for us to tell us, okay, everybody thinks you can go back to work tomorrow. Some of us are not sure we still have our jobs. Whether you're working in the corporate setting or you're working as an entrepreneur, you're not even sure. For the business, you're not sure your, your clients are still there. So it's, it's, it's like life is just starting afresh. I, 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 I told someone, I said, at this point in time, I was wishing, I'm really wishing I was still a kid. So that I could dodge all of this. But fortunately, I'm not. And I have a kid to take care of. So I can't, I can't dodge it. But for me, I think that's that. It's, it's the same thing. It cuts across. Um, entrepreneurs, it cuts across the corporate world. You tell someone who is used to, so you're sure that, yes, like Santa said, even if you've been paid for the month of March, you're not sure you're going to be paid for April if you're sitting at home. So what's going to happen? It's easy to tell people sit at home. Where do they get, more people are going to die of hunger than sitting at home, than even the coronavirus out there. So people are like, okay, if I stay in here, I die. If I go out there, I die. Which is the best I think we're losing um, Peniel there. I'm not too sure. I think that, that um, like, Santa also said one of the things we should be from each other's hands. So we should also ask ourselves what are Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, so if you can hear me, so I think that's that's basically it. It's it's more or less the same thing. You're not sure your jobs are waiting for you. You are now going to have to think. Do I have to become an entrepreneur by force? Do I have to start small businesses? Your clients are there. For those who have, so um, before the lockdown was done in, before the lockdown was done in Lagos, a lot of people who sell perishable um, things had to start selling them off because if, if they have an expiry date, you're not sure how long it will stay. So there's already a record of loss. You've already lost even your capital. So people who had maybe um, biscuits, who had things that are canned food that have an expiry date. You're not sure how long this lockdown is going to be. So everybody's like, let everything go. We're just going to trust that things will come to a seeming normal without losing a lot of people. But mental health is going to be affected. I think it's, it's going to be the this season we're going to record the highest of such um Fair yeah point. so that's Fair it point. thank you so much for raising that um i know that um part of the the information that Sinella shared with us at the start of the call for those of you who didn't join us earlier was part of the programs that um, Women Empower Global works on is, you know, mentorship programs. Uh, we do have support groups. We share a lot of, you know, positive messaging. So we know that in such seasons like this, and I think that that's one of the takeouts we would get from your session, is um, a challenge. Mental health issues are going to spike. So how can we as women actually support each other in moments like this? So I'm just going to ask that question out so that as we continue with the call, people can, you know, think about it, you know, have it to the back of your minds, maybe have, you know, solutions that work in your network and how you can share that with us. 
Um, don't forget to follow our social media platforms right away if you haven't, so that you can um, eventually uh, be part of our support groups and share with other women who are just as much as dealing with these issues that Peniel and Santa have raised so far. We have Lynette from Uganda. She's a student. She's going to be sharing um, her information uh, or at least her experience on what this means for students in her area and the impact it has on students because you know that's also an area we need to think about if we're thinking about girl child education promoting educated women empowered women people are looking to take different courses going to school empower themselves but now um as much as this is a um um, one of the conversations we're trying to have, especially in terms of, you know, gender equality and all of that, what would this mean really for people who are trying to extend and ex ex expand their learning experiences and are going to school? I know that we've mentioned online schooling, and I, I'm sure that that is where a lot of um, <laughs> the classes would have to go. But what does this mean for people in communities who do not yet um, have access to technology that would allow them to continue their schooling. So we just want to hear from Lynette what it feels like in her country for students, what it means to people like herself who are in school and how this has affected them on the regular. So Lynette, um, if you'd like to share with us. Hi guys, um, hi once again, I'm Lynette from Uganda. I am a university student and I must say in Uganda, this hasn't yet affected students heavily, like how it's affecting the corporate world or any other sector. For students, it hasn't yet hit as much because it has been taken as a holiday because holidays are supposed to come a month later, but most schools have decided that this will be the holiday and then we shall resume school a month later. However, it will only affect us when this, if, if this pandemic gets worse and we stay home for more than 30 days. Um, for you, affected me, Kenya. Okay, for the first year students, I don't think it does affect them so much because they have, they had a longer holiday later, about four months, which I think they'll be able to cover up. But then for me as a second year student, it does affect me because um, in the longer holiday, I'm supposed to have my internship, but due to this, I think our internship will be shortened. It will be like one month or less, and most students actually look forward to this internship training because it's time for us to connect to the outside world, to, to the corporate world, to learn what people actually do on the job. So us. Um, this has actually stolen a lot of time from our internship. And also organizations may not be willing to recruit interns this time because of what, like the situation that's going on. Then um, also for third year, the finalists, it does affect them a lot because they graduate later and they are tired. Most of them are actually tired of school and they can't wait to get out. But now this is going to keep them in school longer and they have to graduate later, they start working later. Um, then I think how this has affected us as students mostly is most students have been left idle. Um, people are very idle and thus we're resorting, people are resorting to very funny challenges online and apps. There's, for example, there's an app that Ugandans use. It's called the house party app where people party online. They drink and they party in their houses. Or there's a challenge that we have called the 200 milliliter challenge where people take gin of 200 milliliters without stopping at a go. And people result into pornography and a lot of idle time for our students has really, yes, it has really hurt. It has come, like students do not need to be idle. And when they are idle, they do bad things with their time. And yes, um, also where this has affected us a lot, for Uganda, we have not yet adopted a lot of online education. So we, we're basically not having class. Everything has stopped. Like me personally, I have no class. I just have to read on my own. And 
reading on your own is very hard. So since we don't have online classes, most schools are in rural areas, they don't have access to technology. If this continues, then school will have to stop, will have to repeat years, and that will not be nice. So yes, for me, um, from my side, I don't have much to share, but as we have all seen, this affects us generally. And yeah, so does it affect us as students? Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynette. Um, just for those of you who joined later, Lynette is one of our volunteers on the African Women Leadership Forum. So we're going to be moving on to Dr. Itamba. Um, she's going to be sharing with us um, what this means for mothers, um, what this would really mean, how this has really affected such people, that group of people. I know that um, I think Fatima or Catherine, I'm not too sure, who raised that as a question, but somebody actually did raise that and we're glad that in, in, in our conversations, we tried as much as possible to, to include what this would mean for mothers and children. Uh, we saw Peniel's daughter run into the room. Um, that's so exciting because you know we do have mothers on the group um, and, and what it also mean for pregnant women because we know that with the scare that is at hand, many people are afraid to go out. So what would this really entail for such groups of people? Hi, Itamba, you can now share with us. All right. Um, hi, everyone. So as Belvita said, my name is Itamba Agbonzi. I'm a medical doctor from Cameroon, and I'm also the project manager of a nonprofit organization called Hero Cameroon. And what we do is we try to raise awareness on diseases of public health magnitude. So what we're actually doing here, it's something that is very close to my heart. So I'm, I'm, hello to everyone before I start talking, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk to us about the impact of the coronavirus on women, especially pregnant women and children. So I'm going to start by talking about the impact on pregnant women. And generally during pregnancy, the immune system of women is usually weakened because our bodies are trying to accommodate um, the, new the new baby we're, we're, we're carrying. And so our immune system weakens so that the body doesn't reject the baby. And in our immune system becoming weak, it makes us more susceptible to infections, especially respiratory infections. And so with the advent of the coronavirus, um, there is the, the, the question of whether pregnant women are more susceptible to the coronavirus than the normal population. In the UK, for example, when they talk about people who are at higher risk of coronavirus or higher risk of um, severe infections, you have people who are immunodepressed, you have people who have diseases like diabetes, and they also um, include pregnant women in that list. However, um, the World Health Organization has said that pregnant women are not at higher risk of the disease or at higher risk of severe illnesses um, from coronavirus. So um, what we're seeing is that there's not a global consensus on the risk of the virus for pregnant women, but everybody agrees that pregnant women should take the necessary precautions, should um, stay indoors, should practice uh, social or physical distancing, as Lindsay Ann said, in order that they can prevent the virus. In the UK, again, for example, they've said that women should Pregnant women should be able to stay home for about 12 weeks, but during that period, they should not um, miss out on their prenatal care because that's when they get to, to be examined. That's when they get to look at the baby and see whether anything is going wrong with the baby. So it's important that even, even, even as we're social distancing and we're trying to adopt the preventive measures, pregnant women should still try to keep in touch with their midwives and their gynecologists to ensure that the pregnancy goes on successfully. Um, the good thing about this virus is that um, as, as, as yet, there is no evidence that the virus can be transported or transmitted from mother to child, either during delivery or through breast milk. So we are sure that coronavirus doesn't um, impose an additional risk to the baby during pregnancy or to the mother. So if a woman gets, is pregnant and she gets in contact with the virus, depending on her other comorbidities, then um, the severity of her 
of the infection. That's what it's going to depend on. It's not because she's pregnant that she's going to be susceptible to a more severe infection. In fact, a study done by the WHO, um, they looked at 147 women who were exposed to the virus. And of those women, only 8% of them had a severe infection and just 1% of them had critical infection with the virus. So, I mean, for pre pregnant women, it's a bit positive, if I can use that word in quotes, to say that the fact that you're pregnant doesn't increase the risk of you getting the virus or the risk of you having a severe infection with the virus. Now, talking about the effect of the virus on pregnancy, again, there is no evidence that the virus causes an increase in the risk of miscarriages or an increase in the risk of um, birth defects. So as yet, because we know that this virus is very new, so for all the research that we have on this virus now, the virus doesn't affect the pregnancy. So if you have coronavirus and you have a mild infection, you can go through your pregnancy normally. You're not at increased risk of having a miscarriage. You're not at increased risk of giving birth to a malformed baby. But if you have other comorbidities like HIV, like um, high blood pressure, diabetes, those are the things that can increase your risk of having a severe infection with the coronavirus. Now, talking about breastfeeding, because after you've, you've, um, given, you've, you've gotten pregnant, you've carried your pregnancy through your nine months and you've given birth, you have to feed your baby. So um, as I've mentioned before, the virus has not been found to be transmitted in breast milk. But what, what are the, the advice from the World Health Organization is for women who are breastfeeding, if you don't have the virus or if you're asymptomatic, then you have to um, adhere to the hygienic measures. So you do your hand hygiene, wash your hands properly before breastfeeding. And for those who have um, symptoms of the, um, of the virus, it is advised that they pump out the milk and give it to somebody else or they express the milk and give it to somebody else to feed the baby. And those who have a mild infection and still insist on breastfeeding, it is advised that you practice the sanitary measures and put on a mask while breastfeeding. But the best option for people who are symptomatic or even if you know that you have the disease, express the milk, give it to somebody else to breastfeed the baby. So that's basically um, what I can talk about concerning pregnant women. Now, concerning children, Oh, I think we lost, um, oh no, I think we lost a timer, but I still see her on the call. Um, I think maybe the network is playing um, a fast one on us. Um, but I'm just going to quickly go through some of the issues raised so far concerning her area and her subject, sorry. And um, Catherine Dumbe says, my concern goes to women trying to conceive and women who are already pregnant. With everything going on, it's a little complicated for women generally. But then what about women who are in these categories? Appointments during this time, complicated pregnancies, including refugees and displaced, um, the displaced too. What hope do they have and what can we advise? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, Itamba is back. I think you're back. We're reading out. A, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry a, about that. Yeah, we're reading out an issue that was raised by Catherine. I'm not sure if it captured that or you want me to repeat it for you. Oh, can you repeat that for me, please? Um, no, we were just saying, um, Catherine mentioned that what is, um, what about women who are trying to conceive uh, or already are pregnant, which is what you're addressing? And uh, with the way it's complicated, mm -hmm. what about you know, women in these categories who are trying to probably conceive, um, knowing that appointments are going to be very difficult during such times? And, and what about those with complicated pregnancies? What does this mean for them? What would this mean as, as well for you know, internally displaced women or refugees? As, if you can also help to... Um, just quickly discussing that. 
Yeah, um, that's a very, a, a very, very valid question. And talking about women who are trying to conceive, um, from a medical standpoint, there is no consensus. There's no advice against women trying to conceive during this period. As I've said before, um, the coronavirus doesn't directly affect the pregnancy or it doesn't increase the risk for miscarriages and it doesn't increase the risk of congenital malformations. So if somebody is trying to get pregnant, it's based on, I think it's a personal decision. You consider, you know, this thing has just started. We don't know when it's going to end. And as you've rightly um, noted, it's a bit more complicated. Now you can't just wake up from your house and get to the hospital as it was before, especially in countries where the lockdown is actually being properly practiced. So for those who are still trying to conceive, those are the things that you have to take into consideration before going forward with trying to conceive. Now for those who have already conceived and are pregnant, um, I think that the services in most countries, services for pregnant women are still going to be available. So women are still going to be able to go to their um, doctors for their um, preconception, uh, sorry, for their antenatal visits. It's just that it might be a little bit more complicated. I don't know how it is in other countries, but you might be able to have like an appointment letter showing that I have an appointment to go to the doctor on this day and then you might be allowed to go to the hospital and see your doctor but in countries like ours where the lockdown is not very well we don't yet have a lockdown you should be able to leave your house and go to the uh, hospital but you have to practice the sanitary measures that have been put in place so washing your hands carrying your hand sanitizer around putting on a mask if your country recommends that you should put, not put on a mask and just avoid you know practice the social distances so if they say stand one meter apart from somebody make sure that you practice those sanitary measures so that you who is pregnant and going for your antenatal consultations doesn't pick up the virus in the process that's um, basically the advice that i can give to women who are pregnant at this point Nice. And I was going to go ahead to talk about children. I don't know if I should continue yeah, go ahead. or yeah, be sure. running out of time. Yeah, so um, when I started talking about children, I said that um, there's a bit of a good news when it, uh, concerning this virus when it comes to children in that a lot of children don't pick up the virus. Normally, children are very susceptible to um, respiratory in infections and viral infections. But with the coronavirus, I mean... I don't know what is going on, but children are very much less susceptible to the virus than adults. And there's a study that has been published in one of the best journals of pediatrics, it's called Pediatrics, and it showed that in China, um, of all the children who had the virus, about 94% of them had just mild disease so they had no symptoms uh, or a few of them had moderate symptoms and so they were able to, you know, just you know, go out of the, the disease on its own. And about 4% of them were at high risk and just 1% of them had like severe infections where they had to be hospitalized and put on ventilations, uh, ventilators, which is very good. And when it comes to children, for children who are less than five years old, they are at higher risk of getting the infection. And when children are less than one year old, the risk to, of getting the infection is higher because you know their immune system is not very well uh, formed and they don't have enough antibodies to fight the infection so as we go about our businesses we need to realize that we have to protect the young children children less than five years old especially those who are less than one year old keep them home keep them occupied teach them the sanitary measures make sure their hands are washed make sure they use the hand sanitizers and make sure that we're feeding them properly because nutrition is also a very important um, aspect of boosting our immune system for our children to be to have a strong immune system they have to eat well they have to eat their fruits and their vegetables to make sure that their immune system is well equipped to fight against this virus so that's the little that i can give on the direct effects of the virus on women and children and we've been talking a lot i think lindy ann mentioned it and santa mentioned it and Peniel mentioned it there's also indirect effects of the virus on women in that women are the mothers they have to take care of the children they have stopped working the women have to homeschool their children you know it's a bit it's a bit more difficult during this time to handle your maternal duties, your um, professional duties and all of that. And it also has an effect on the mental health of women and even on children because they're used to going out and playing with their friends. They're used to going to school and interacting with other children and learning. And in Africa, especially because in, in other countries, in developed countries, they still have the 
the um, the internet which they can use to you know continue their lectures and their classes but for us here in africa um digital education is not well well developed so our children are now stuck at home they don't have their teachers to be teaching them most children cannot you know most parents don't have the time to homeschool their children so it's a little bit of an issue for women and children that we have to devise many more mechanisms to keep our children occupied to try to teach them and to keep them protect them from this virus nice um just in case anybody has any questions just quickly drop them as she's sharing just so that um she could just respond in her session so we don't have to come back to a question and answer um, um, session after she's done. But I see um, um, Catherine mentioned something about what about you know systems, health systems that are not efficient and are not re robust enough already on the regular to handle um, fragile cases of pregnant women and mothers. In these cases, such 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 um, such women might not make it. So if they don't make it, um, even though there's not a direct, um, this, it's not yet scientifically proven that there's a direct transfer from the child, from the mother to the child, what happens in such cases? Because I mean, obviously the woman is the, the, the carrier. So what, what, what would you, what do you have to say about that? I mean, that's, that's a really valid point because, I mean, we're talking about Africa where our health systems are really, really underdeveloped or our health systems are not very strong enough to deal with a virus like this. And with pregnant women, if they get infected and they get a severe infection and the mother happens to die, then we end up with a child who is having to grow up without a mother. And that means that that child might not be breastfed which means that the child is more susceptible to infections and malnutrition and things like that because they don't have the proper nutrients to, to feed the child. That means that the child might end up growing up with a grandmother or, if, or another family relative, which is an extra burden on the family. So there's, there's a lot of repercussions that this virus has. And these are things that we as women have to take into consideration. And so when they say stay at home, if you are a woman and you have the means to stay at home it is important that you stay at home keep your children at home communicate with your doctor as often as possible and if it is necessary to go out and see your doctor for your antenatal care consultations you absolutely have to do that but as much as we can we need to do everything that we in, is in our power to prevent ourselves to protect ourselves from having this virus stay at home wash your hands do not accept visitors because um if, if, if you can bear you can you can um, um, bear with me, Velvita, that in Cameroon, we don't have a dog down yet. So people are moving around, people are visiting each other, people are going for their meetings, bars are open. We have to take that as a personal responsibility to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones. And that means staying at home. That means saying to people that please do not visit me during this period because I don't want to have the virus. We have to be strict about it. We don't have to sit down and wait for the government. The government is not going to come and lock us in our houses we have to take the responsibility upon ourselves to protect ourselves because we are the women we are the ones who care for our families and we have to protect our children as well yeah very true um obviously there are not as many rigid measures that are existing in all countries across africa certain have some some countries like i think kenya have cl completely closed their borders um, um, others have, have state lockdown, interstate lockdowns, like, uh, like Penyo from Nigeria mentioned. Um, but I noticed Fatima and, um, um, I had mentioned that in areas like, what, what about countries like, um, like Diaz, Tanzania, uh, Malawi, where there's no lockdown just yet, um, it's not mm -hmm. yet existing. So, um, what, what can, what, what, what are the risk factors involved in such areas? Especially because now we're talking about the, the fact that besides the fact that it would affect businesses, now it's coming to our personal spaces, our mothers, our mm -hmm. children. What do, would you have to say about such areas where there's no lockdown in particular uh, existing? What are the risks really involved uh, in case there are no lockdown measures put in place? 
All right. Um, as Lindsay Ann mentioned in her pre presentation, this virus is spread by, it's a droplet infection. So it's spread by person to person contact. And that's why we're talking about things like social distancing. And that's why we're saying that stay at home. So in countries like Tanzania and countries like Cameroon, where a lockdown has not been put in place, what happens is that people are moving around. People are coughing, people are sneezing, people are touching, touching each other. And that means that the virus can spread from person to person faster. Because if we stay in our houses and if somebody has the virus, the virus is contained within that environment. But when you're moving around, especially people who are asymptomatic, that means people who do not have any symptoms of the disease, they don't know that they carry the, the disease. So they go around touching people, they go around touching surfaces because it's not just about you sneezing and getting the virus to touch another person no there's evidence that the virus can stay on surfaces of our phones on surfaces of, on table surfaces on doorknobs and things like that so when a lockdown is not um, in, enforced it exposes the people and it increases the rate of transmission from one person to another because people keep going around and touching surfaces and touching each other and it propagates the virus so for 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 Counties like Tanzania and counties like Cameroon and other counties where the, the lockdown has not been enforced, we as individuals have to keep on putting on um, pressure on the government for them to institute, institute a lockdown. And also on an individual basis, like I said before, if it is possible for you to stay at home, please stay at home. If it's not possible for you to stay at home, then you have to make sure that you adhere to the sanitary measures that have been put in place. Wash your hands as often as you can for 20 seconds. Sing the happy birthday song as you wash your hand. And when the song is over, that's when you should stop washing your hands. Running water, soap, wash your hands. Buy your hand sanitizer. Your hand sanitizer has to be, it has to contain at least 60% alcohol. We are in Africa and we know that everybody is trying to make ends meet and people are going to create fake hand sanitizers. When you're buying a product, please, please, please look at it, read up and make sure that it has at least 60% of alcohol because if it's not up to 60% of alcohol, you've wasted your money and you're not going to be protected. So get your hand sanitizers, get your mask, try to stay taxi. For those of us who use public transport, make sure that there are not more than two people seated at the back of the taxi and two people seated in front try to avoid overcrowded places if it is not absolutely necessary do not leave your house right thanks so much for mentioning that um and now that you have said you know these are the measures that we need to adopt on the personal level so thank you so much itamba dr itamba for doing um, thanks a lot uh, for, for having us, me uh, such, such a such a wonderful wonderful rundown on what is expected of us and how each and each and every individual on this call and our family and our networks can actually work towards um keeping ourselves safe i know that it's a hard time and people are struggling really to make a lot of ends meet and now we're thinking about if people have to work from home what are the tips that we can um we can give people who have to work from home i mean we're trying to encourage work from home for those who are still, who still have to mm -hmm. work. I mean, for those who still have jobs, for those, um, yeah, who absolutely. I mean, those the frontline workers, those who absolutely need to work from home. What are, in your opinion, um, and, and I can throw this to everybody else on the call. If you're on this call, just, you know, drop in a message for us. What, what do you think? um would be advisable for people who have to work from home what are the tips you can you can you can share with us i know that peniel is a mother she's struggling to work she's struggling to stay run a business she's struggling to take care of her kids at the same time so this is not an obvious um situation for people in her case um so you as you happen to live in the um dr itamba happened to live in the united kingdom so she can tell us, you know, in systems where technology has been very, you know, like high, high tech exists and living now in Cameroon, what would you say are the challenges from working from home? Well, um, working from home, you know, you're, you're used, when you're working at your place of work, you're used to your office setup, you're used to, okay, I have to wake up, I have to get up at eight o'clock, I have to be at work at eight o'clock and sit at my desk. You're used to your normal conditions of work. But being at home now, you know, there's a lot of self-discipline that has to be 
put in place. Because if you're working from home, you can wake up from your bed at 7.59 and put on your computer and you start working. So there's a lot of self-discipline that has to take, you know, take into, to be taken into consideration. You have, like you've said, Peniel is there while trying to have the school and her child is running around. So there's, those are the challenges. You have your family members now who are there at home. Maybe the space is not enough. You're working on your own desk. Your husband is there. He's also trying to work. We have to, there's a lot of adaptation that has to um, get into the whole idea of working at home. There's also the health aspects associated with it because working from home means that we don't, have, we don't wake up anymore and walk out walk out or you know for people who could take a walk to work they no longer do that you could climb the stairs to get to your building you no longer do that we're now sedentary and it means that people are going to put on weight it means that people are going to uh, a lot more people are going to be um, immobile which is not good for our health so what i'm going to advise is if you're working from home and you're sitting on your computer from let's say eight o'clock to like five o'clock for your normal working day after every 30 minutes Please stand up and stretch or take a walk for about. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. So I was saying that if you're working from home, after every 30 minutes, you have to stand up from your from your bed or from your chair or wherever you're, work, you're working at your workstation and go around and walk around for about three minutes. Make sure that you stretch, make sure that you just, you know, get your blood pumping through your veins and through your muscles to make sure that, you know, you don't have, because when you're, one of the risk factors for immobility is that you might develop clots. And there have been studies that have reported an increase in the level of um, deep venous thrombosis, which is caused by formation of clots because people are immobile. So if you are working from home, Stand up after every 30 minutes, go around, take a walk, make sure that you take your breaks and have your food, make sure that you take your breaks and drink water, and make sure that you end your work at your normal working time. Because for people who are workaholics, this is the time when they're going to be on their computers from morning to midnight. If you're a nine to five person, take your normal one hour break that you're used to and close your work at five o'clock, go and hang out with your family, talk to your friends on social media, play board games with your family members and just make sure that, you know, you're getting your required social interactions because this is not the time, I promise you, this is not the time for you to stay on your computer from 12 o'clock to midnight and just, you know, yes, yeah, Santa, I'm talking to you. This is not the time for you to stay on your computer <laughs> from, from, from 1 o'clock to 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. No, wake up, stretch do your exercise, interact with other people and make sure that your mental health is good. Because there's something that Donald Trump said. He said, after the coronavirus, people are going to, the coronavirus is not going to, it's not, it's not going to be as severe as the depression that is going to come after it. So if we don't look after ourselves during this period and we socially isolate ourselves and put ourselves into our work, then we're setting up ourselves for depression after we're done beating the coronavirus. So please, 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 we should encourage fora like this where we can set up time to talk to each other and just discourse. And, you know, another thing that we need to do is do exercise. There are people who are used to going to the gyms and now gyms are closed all over. Let me not say all over the world, but majority of gyms are closed. So we can do our own personal exercise, the crunches, the lounges, the planks. There are so many apps on the app stores these days that have um, 30 minutes workouts or five minutes or seven minutes workouts that you can do to keep yourself fit. Physical activity is good, not just for your body and for your heart, but it's also good for your mental health. So please, 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 physical activity, do your exercise, interact with your friends, do your work because I mean, most of us live for the work that we do. As Santa mentioned in her talk, she kept talking about doing work for the passion of it. A lot of us are doing things because we're passionate about them and we need to keep on doing that. But because you're now working from the comfort of your home, do not take this as an opportunity. I'm insisting on this because I know that a lot of people are now doing that. Do not take this as an opportunity to stay on your computer from morning to night. Work, right. take your breaks, eat, exercise, and interact with people. That's all I'm going to say. Nice. So as we close our session, I know Ruth has something to share um, in terms of e-learning, some, you know, credits that we can have for students during such periods. Ruth, would you just share with us quickly? 
you need to unmute yourself. Lovely. Um, I think the biggest thing, what I keep hearing, and it's not just, um, it's not just from this forum, it's that school stopped and then school stopped. So there's no more learning. There's nothing else that we're doing in an age where most of our learning happens online. Um, we currently live in Sri Lanka. And last year, around this time, we had bombings at Easter. And what happened was it made a lot of schools start to reevaluate because everything just shut down. Every, everybody had to reevaluate how to reach their students, how to keep their students engaged, how to keep learning ongoing, and so on and so forth. Um, the school my daughter goes to, fortunately, they get reading lists that we have to make sure they've read at least 60% of the books in that list throughout the whole year, even during school time. Um, so uh, uh, to some extent, we are better prepared. Now, I'm from Kenya. Kenya, the government's been promising um, laptops for every child uh, at school so that they can get better at e-learning and Wi-Fi at schools and all this stuff. Up to today, they haven't developed anything or delivered anything and I feel like this is such um, a letdown to our, our children because parents we can do so much fine some of us are in privileged positions where, where we get to um, uh, we do offer such services to our children or, um, sorry hold on one second kind day <laughs> um, Okay. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, we get to that position okay. where we can provide the technology, but a lot of people are not able to provide that technology. Schools are willing. Uh, my parents are both educators and they're willing to take the time to get online and interact with the students. But a lot of our governments fail us on that aspect in that they don't provide the necessary support that we need. And, and a lot of countries are now taking away like tuition, which I'm 100% for because I believe students need time at home to play and become children. But they shouldn't suffer at a time like this when it's been an ongoing plan, it's been budgeted for year after year, and still we're not getting the delivery of the services. Um, so my daughter, today was her last day of school. She's had school ever since uh, lockdown. We are like week four in Sri Lanka of complete lockdown, which has been great. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that, that um, a lot of the kids, especially in our neighborhood, are still online engaging with their teachers on social media, trying to get stuff. And parents are really getting their kids to read at this time. So I think that's an, another um, initiative that parents have to take on for themselves. Get them to read stuff. If you don't have good books, let them read a manual on how to work windows 10 and then like let them do it not on your computer that you're using or anything but like you know let them read something that um helps them learn um and in that note um i was thinking about some a lot of people will have issues like right now being stuck at home and say you are working somewhere and you can't go to work and you can't do remote work but you have access to a computer or you, you have access to your smartphone and stuff and you have skills that you can actually deliver to people um I, we were just going through a few websites that i've used that i've trusted i've sent my work in some of them i haven't used yet but i checked them out today on how you can monetize your skills and at a time when isolation is important, that's also important to be able to sell soft skills online. It can be anything from uh, digital design um, to, to writing, to editing, to just there's so many things, doing recipes for people and so on. And some of the websites that I found are, um, I'm just gonna name a few, which I wrote down somewhere. Um, Websites like Fiverr.com, that's F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Um, and then you just sign up um, to start selling. So uh, forward slash start. The lower hyphen thingy, I can never remember the name of it. And then selling, and that's it. Um, and then you also have remote tasks. So it's R-E-M-O-T-A-S-K-S -S, um, dot com stroke sign up. Um, and I've got 
Dr.com and just see how you can at this time, especially if you don't have stuff to do and you feel a little whelmed, um, get online and see what you can do to, um, to kind of like get yourself geared up again. Because I know a lot of career websites are like you have to be physically there to do the job or they require like 50% remote working, but try these as well. And they're not like um, a, light, a, a forever lifeline. They're a lifeline for right now, but if you have other passions that you still wanna follow once the thing is over, you go ahead and follow that. But um, I like what we talked about before about um, reforms in our systems. And this is the time to really push it. Taxes, for instance, that was a big thing that kind of like took me aback. Like you can't be paying taxes if you're not earning. Um, and also um, the schools and the issues that we're facing with our students. I would hate to be, to miss an entire year or to have finished school, got my acceptance letter finally, and then not be able to start school because next year they'll be busy redoing year one or something. So I completely identify with that. Um, but yeah, just check out those websites. I'm going to type them on here and then you guys yeah, can look at them too. if you are, if you're ready. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sure. So you can um, just thank share you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was so insightful. Um, Ruth is encouraging each and every one of us to still chase our passions while we're stuck and worried about indoors. Um, some people are developing, um, um, what they call it, claustrophobia. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so some yeah. people are developing, are becoming so, they didn't even know they were claustrophobic, so they've just realized <laughs> with this virus that they actually don't like staying indoors, um, as opposed to, you know, um, them choosing to stay indoors. Those are two different conversations. So while we're indoors, and as women that we are, the African Women's Leadership Forum, is trying to help all women that we can possibly help to be productive during such time. So as Ruth has shared, she shared, you know, the links, you can check out those websites, you can sign up, you can sign up on all of them if you want. Uh, nobody's stopping you from signing up on all of them so far as to get you busy. But as Dr. Itamba mentioned, please don't stay all day on your computer screen that is not healthy at all um, some people are very guilty of that we can see them hiding their faces already um, <laughs> so we know no calling of names but hey sister <laughs> we see you <laughs> um, so um, with that we wanted also to moving forward to share, um, you know, just a few tips on um, how you can stay healthy or, you know, nutritional things that you can you probably eat because I know food is also an issue. If you're dealing with lockdown, a lot of people um, resort to stress, stress feeding. Um, and I mean, I, I can speak for myself. I'll most likely be, you know, chewing one thing to the next. So it is important for us to actually stay healthy during such periods because, you know, one thing will lead to the other. The coronavirus is here, but we might just develop some other illness after that if we don't eventually get the virus. So um, one of the things we want to share, the first thing is please increase your fruit and vegetable intake. Um, you know, you can purchase uh, fresh vegetables from the store during such lockdown. For those who have access, I know that some countries allow you to do grocery shopping. I think um, sometimes they allow for some people to step out and do grocery shopping. For those who haven't, please go do your fresh grocery shopping. You can cook large bowls of soup um, and store with those fresh ingredients. Those will last you longer and those are a lot more healthy. Um, a second tip we can have is, um, I think we're gonna have that on the screen. Um, the second thing you can do um, is use healthy canned foods. For people who, you know, we know that the, there's a lockdown and, you know, markets are not open. You have to resort to what is on the market uh, or what is available. And the only things that are not perishable will be items like canned foods uh, or dried items like beans, lentils, peas, rice, you know, those are things that you 
can um, adopt in your meal plan moving forward. But please try to get healthy canned food, check the expiry date, um, check the ingredients, um, check the nutrient, the values, the nutrient values and all of that. So you're not um, putting yourself more at risk. Um, you can build up on, on healthy um, eating snacks. I know for people like myself who love to eat, um, is, you know, you can snack, add up your, stash up your snacks, but please let them be healthy, you know, healthy snacks, yogurts, eggs, but eat them in really nice quantities. Don't go overboard, I beg. <laughs> and, and another thing we can do is, you know, we can try to find fun ways of drinking water. Water, 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 water. I know we cannot stress that enough. Please try to stay as much as possible away from sodas and sugary drinks because um, those in the long run do have an effect on our, on our systems. But if we can think of fun ways to add more water into our drinking, I always say it's a fun way. You can add a fruit, you can add flavor, you can try different things, you know, chop oranges, cucumbers, I don't know, something. Just add a fruit, just to add some flavor to your water, lime, lemon, berries. That would be a really good way to enjoy your water <laughs> and still enjoy some good flavor. Um, and then you can, you know, try to limit as much as possible processed foods. I know that um, for those, for areas where the, you know, KFCs, processed foods and all of that, you know, my burgers, everybody's probably going to be jumping at that because that's an easy way out to, to feeding yourselves. But as much as we can try to limit um, processed foods, um, ready-to-eat meals, packaged snacks, all of those things can be very highly saturated with fats and sugars and salt. And, and that, that, that's not what we need, honestly. I know that it's a difficult time, but we can try to stay away from processed foods as much as possible and look for healthier options. And the last thing that I would like for all of us to do, because we are an AWLF family, we're a family of women, we're women empowered global. We want to encourage everybody else to, in this moment that you're spending, especially like Penny mentioned, spending a lot of time with your family, you can devise fun activities for your family. You can cook and eat together. Um, you can have your children, you know, participate in the task as well, get them busy. They can, you know, chop the onions or, you know, meal prep or wash the dishes just so that everybody else feels like they're connected in, in such moments and they can share um, meaningful time with their family. So on that note, um, we thank you so every single one of you for joining our call. We're really, really grateful that you could pick out time to participate in this call. I'm sure Sinella would have something to close the call. And uh, we wanted to also take a group photo um, as we normally do that. So if you could just nicely pose and smile, Sinella is going to give us the, the go ahead so that we can have a group. <laughs> a group. We're devising, hey guys, we're trying to devise fun ways of staying indoors. So if we can't take physical photos together, we can at least take them online. <laughs> and it's still going oh, to serve as a, fam as a family picture. And I love how, Do thank you, Velvita. Thank you for the, the wonderful Lovely speakers and the medical professionals and the business professionals we have on board today. Y'all have been so lovely. Thank you. And um, do know we have captured everything and Velvita and I are, you know, and the team are going to look at producing some sort of guidance uh, based on the feedback and what the solutions we want to achieve during this <laughs> challenging time. And something that even Dr. Tamba said, I really, really love it. She said, um, I think it was Dr. Tamba said, you know, social distancing is different to physical distancing. We should still be socially connected. Or was it Peniel who said we need to be socially connected but physically distant? Because now what's happening is we keep telling the world social distance means social distance. And there's a lot of, you know, tension. Uh, you know, we miss our families and, you know, our parents are living elsewhere. So then there's all this tension. But at the end of the day, 
always remember though we get on with digital uh, always remember though we're in the giga world we still operate with our heart and our mind so never lose touch with more technology you should never compromise on the relationships that's so important especially during now and ladies in closing what i want to tell 